Hi everyone, my name is Jack. Uh, I work at Entrepreneur First. How many people in the room know what Entrepreneur First is? Okay, that's all right. This means this should be for you this talk. Um, we help people build companies. Um, and so my job is talking to people who are interested in building companies. Um, and I spend most of my time having conversations with really interesting people all around the world about what they want to do with their lives. Um, what I want to talk to you today is about kind of the lessons I've learned about some of the things that people get wrong when it comes to building AI-driven companies. And so we've been around for about five years now. Um, and if you have been around like we are in London for the last five years, there's obviously huge amounts of AI uh, going on. And it's ended up that we've ended up with more machine learning investments than anyone else in Europe. And we've built about 100 companies that are collectively worth over a billion. And this is interesting because we're not just an investment fund. Um, we don't just go around finding people. And we're not just an accelerator. What we do is we build companies before people have the idea and before they have the team. So we fund people to come together before they know exactly what they want to work on, before they've found the people that they want to work with, to come together to meet and fund them to work for a couple of months, three to five months, really working out with the very best thing they could be working on. Um, and come up with an idea. And the reason why I put this like this is because I talk to about a couple of hundred people a year. Um, and I always ask them kind of what the biggest problem they face is. And I think from that is there's a clear, clear winner, which is that finding people to work with is the biggest problem that people find. I think if we all got together and started talking about ideas afterwards, we could come up with a lot. Um, they wouldn't necessarily all be good, but we could come up with them. Whereas finding people to, uh, to work with is really, really hard. Um, finding people who are good is really difficult. You have to come to a lot of events like this. You have to eat a lot of pizza uh, and drink a lot of beer, um, which is like a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your dietary preferences. Um, and you have to find people who are good, you have to find people who are available, and you have to find people who are like, motivated and want to start a company. So actually, how many people here like, are, would say they are like, reasonably interested in the idea of starting a company? OK, that's a significant amount. But it's also, there's a lot of people who are like, you know what, this isn't for me. Um, and I apologize for this talk, but hopefully there'll be something interesting for it. Um, but that's kind of the thing is that filtering down and finding the right people is really, really tough. Um, but our approach is working. These are some of the companies that we built in London, just a selection of the AI companies we built in London. I realize it's kind of been slightly overrunning, so I just want to tell you about one, which is Magic Pony Technology, which is the by far the worst named company of, of any uh, up there. Uh, Magic Pony was founded um, a couple of years ago, and it was founded by two Imperial grads, two Imperial alumni that um, came to Entrepreneur First and had never met before. Um, so one was a PhD student called Zihan Wang, and one was um, out of a master's program uh, called Rob Bishop, who was the first employee at Raspberry Pi. And so they never met at Imperial. They met at AEF. They tried out a couple of different teams. And they started working on this idea that was making video stream faster with less data. Um, it, was, it was using Zhan's some of the skills from Zhan's PhD. So Zhan had done a PhD in medical imaging. And they thought, why don't we just apply this to kind of imaging in general? How can we go with this? They started working on it for a bit, and they hired some people from Zihan's lab. Zihan hired some people here would have probably been working underneath to come work for him. Um, built out a team of about kind of 12 people. Um, published a bunch of papers. Got a bunch of patents. Um, and 18 months after they first met, they sold it to Twitter for $150 million. Uh, reportedly. I have to legally say reportedly at the end there. But reportedly $150 million. Um, which is a really impressive return for 18 months' work. And it's a really impressive return for kind of what they were working on at that time academically. Zihan was leading effectively a research lab of really, really impressive people about a year out of his PhD. Um, and when I was at NIPS last year, I skipped this one, but when I was at NIPS last year, uh, Magic Pony got a, a mention in the keynote speech in front of about 6,000 people. So it's, it's working really well helping people work on really important stuff. Um, and doing so in a way that maximizes what they're kind of working on. And so this thing about coming up with the idea and finding the right idea is really important. Um, and I want to stress it because from my time, which I spend talking to people all the time from all around Europe, um, 
people have terrible ideas. Um, people really, really have bad ideas. And I think it's something where I think I've just become normal for, for me and to, to realize, but I don't think a lot of people realize it, that really, really, really smart people just like have ideas that suck all the time and that's completely normal. Zihan and Rob, I think at one stage were working on an idea that uh, like optimized uh, electricity use in chicken shops. Uh, Zihan was working on an idea that could like detect fake handbags. And if they'd worked on that, they wouldn't be running a research team, they wouldn't be running the research team in Twitter now. Um, working on bad ideas is, is really costly. And you probably have a bad idea. Um, if you're sat in this room with an idea now, the likelihood is it sucks. Um, and that, that matters traditionally because all the other institutions out there in the world that help people build companies really care about the idea. Uh, investors really need a good idea. Accelerators really need a good idea. Um, customers need you to have a good idea. And at EF, I think what we're doing is we're saying, look, people have bad ideas, but there's actually real huge potential still in those people. And if they had a good idea, it could be really important. Um, and I think it's also pretty normal to have a bad idea because it's really easy to have one. Um, and it's really easy to kind of stumble into it. Because ideas are effectively hammers looking for nails. And what I mean by this is people jump into ideas really, really quickly. I think the, the, when I kind of engage with people at this early stage, they, are, they know they want to do something big. They know they want to build something impressive, that they've got the potential to do something bigger. And very quickly, that manifests itself onto an idea that they happen to have. And so rather than this kind of vague, uncomfortable, slightly haziness of wanting to build a startup, you end up uh, becoming very quickly obsessed with an idea. And that's, that's dangerous because, like we know, that idea couldn't be very good. And the important thing is actually that potential and that ambition. And that ambition is what I think is really interesting. And that ambition is what is really powerful. And ideas become hammers looking for nails because ideas are all about solutions. They're all about fixing problems. Um, and they're all about technologies fixing problems. Um, and people like you really love solutions. Um, and what I mean by people like you here, um, in a slightly brexit language, but people like you uh, means here people that are interested in kind of difficult technical problems. People that are interested in stuff that is challenging. People that are going to spend an hour playing around with Trump and Obama's tweets because it's intellectually interesting. People like doing this. People like working on this. And it means that very quickly you can start jumping to, you know what, actually we could fix this. We could fix this really, really quickly and we could start working on it. Um, or maybe you could do this. And worrying straight about fixing solutions is, is, or fixing problems and worrying about a solution is, is dangerous. So this is like a standard idea. To give you an example, this is like a standard EF idea uh, that someone like might come to us um, at the start of the program. Or I'd have like someone talk to me about this, or I'd turn up at a conference and someone say, are we thinking about this? And this is, a, this is like not a, a crazy idea. It sounds reasonably sensible, which is normally a flag, if something sounds sensible. Um, it sounds reasonably sensible. And the reason this is problematic is because the, the ways that this company might fall down, the trip hazards, there's really kind of two of them. There's first one that the deep reinforcement learning doesn't work well enough. You haven't got a model that is effective enough, that, that isn't solved. And the second one is, this isn't a big enough problem for transport companies. Um, so like, which one do you think is likely to be the most likely one to cause this company to fail? Is it number one or number two? Two, right? Two, right. But Whatever, there we go. So it is two, it is two. But what everyone would want to work on, what everyone has a tendency to work on is go straight into one. Because trying to make deep reinforcement learning or trying to make machine learning models work effectively is interesting. And actually getting the first bit to work reasonably well is you can get quite quickly and it seems like you've got traction. You're doing something where it kind of works and getting that final, eking out that final couple of percent of accuracy matters, but it's really hard and you can put a couple of months into it. And I think people have a tendency, particularly People who are very good at what they do, people who are, are comfortable working on really hard problems, people who are comfortable doing stuff which other people will be afraid of, um, have a tendency to jump into these types of problems and to start working on them. And that is dangerous if that top one is going to take you months to fix, or it's going to take you years to get right. Because when you do it and it fixes it, no one cares. No one's bothered. It's not interesting. And if you spend your time 
working on something that isn't interesting is really dangerous. And so every company that we've ever built has failed pretty much because of this, because they started working on something where it wasn't a big enough interesting problem to uniquely solve. It wasn't interesting enough. And what we're kind of thinking about is stop thinking about solutions, stop thinking about kind of technical, interesting stuff that's going on, and start thinking about problems, and finding a real problem, and finding one that is worth working on. And this is kind of Mark Andreessen quote, and the idea is if you find a problem, that will usually lend you to the solution. So investigating problems is still a really good worthwhile use of your time. And investigating them whilst being a person where you're comfortable and know and have security, knowing that you are technically brilliant enough to be able to solve it when it comes to it, means that the solution will pop out to you in a way where if you're just a, a random person on the street, it probably wouldn't. And so there's still you're not kind of walking away from that technical skill, so you're not abandoning it, but you're focusing on the problem and working out what's interesting. And what I kind of EF, what we talk about is trying to find hair on fire problems. And hair on fire problems are really important because if, if I was standing here right now and I had a kind of my hair was on fire and you came up and tried to pitch a company to me and you said, you know what, my company is a beautiful hose. It's got a lovely little shower head on the end. The water's going to be nice and warm. It's not going to damage your hair. I'm absolutely going to buy it. But no, no startup's first product looks like that. All startup's products look terrible. If you were to come up and offer me like a brick and my hair was on fire, I'd take the brick and I'd use it to repeatedly batter my head to try and smother the flames. Whatever you're going to build, even if you're really good, is going to suck <laughs> first time round. And if you find someone who is so desperate that they'll still take it, then you're onto something interesting. And then you're onto something that's worth your time. And that's that's really important. I think it's really, really kind of worth making sure that you can get something big enough. Um, and so a lot of people work on stuff where it's a nice idea. It's a nice idea. And if you come and present someone, if you give them a solution and say, hey, here's your, here's your kind of transportation schedules. I've used some deep learning to make them a little bit more efficient. No one's going to be like, oh, I don't really care. Often the most common response is, hey, that's kind of neat. But the problem is that's kind of neat isn't going to pay your salary. And it's not going to pay, pay you to build a company. You've got to find someone where, before you have anything, people are already desperate for you to fix it. People are already showing you the way, and that's what I mean about drawing the solution out of it. If you come up and you chat to me and you say, hey, what's going on in your life? And I'm like, oh, it's all right. You know, my bus was a little bit late, and uh, I was a little bit hungry. Oh, and also my head is on fire. You're going to be like, I think we should fix the head on fire thing. And you'll help me extinguish my head on fire, and I'll be really grateful, and you'll be like a savior. And that's the kind of potential, and that's how you should be thinking about it. It'll pop out. To someone who's smart, who understands kind of how things could be, you'll see that actually, sometimes I won't even realize. I think that's the other thing which flips around when you have this kind of technical brilliance is you can walk into someone and you can say, how's it going? And I'm like, it's good. It's annoying that my head is really warm all the time, and I'm feeling a lot of pain. And you're like, I know a way we can get rid of that. And it's, I think a lot of people don't realize their hair is on fire. But if you're able to have conversations with them about problems and about the ideas they're working on, that's really important. And so we stopped kind of this idea of product market fit that's thrown about. We kind of scrapped that. I think product market fit, it's not that it's not important. I just think it's the wrong way of looking at it completely. Really, you should be thinking about market product fit. And starting with the market, the market being the interesting thing, the market being the thing you aim to go out and become an expert in, and then finding how you'll fix that problem when you come to it market giving you the problem. And working for this is really, that's, that's, this, is, this is the kind of the way you can find it. And so when you go out, you want to be the person who is the expert in a problem, the expert in a market, and the expert in something really big, rather than the expert person who's built a product that you're desperately trying to find a solution for, and desperately trying to find work. There's also another thing, which is just like solutions in general are myopic. They're like not. They're not interesting. The, one of the biggest problems with this is like, it's super boring. It's really dull. It's not cool. It's not interesting. And I think um, where there's no real vision here is in the potential to change how we, there's some stuff in there where you could really engage with it and make it big. If you could change how humans interact with space and how, how they travel, there's something where you could build a vision there that could be really, really exciting. It could be massive. 
But what it is, is making bus timetables a little bit better for some people that don't really care. And that's because you've started off with doing something that's neat and is possible, or is a little bit hard and interesting, rather than thinking, I'm going to go out and talk to people about the world and find out what's the opportunity here, what's really interesting. And making sure things are big and it's important is really good. Because at the end of the day, if, if you're in this room, you should be building something that's worth, like, kind of worth you. You should respect yourself and build something that's kind of worthy of someone who's put a lot of time into getting good at something. And this, the power that we have in the room now means that this is kind of unprecedented in history in terms of how much impact you can have in the world. And it's, if you're not going to try and take advantage of that, it's a real shame. You should, you, should be, you should be trying to be as ambitious as possible. And EF believes that the most ambitious thing you can do is start a company. And, this, and so we think about ambition a lot. And we think about what ambitious people should be doing. Um, and this is kind of how we break it down. We think that, firstly, lowering your ambition doesn't save you. What, what do I mean by this? Building a company is hard. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter too much on the size of the company. I really like fish and chip shops. I really, really like them. They're great. I like fish. In batter, I like chips. Put them together. You've got a shop I'm going to enjoy. But building a, building a fish and chip shop and running a fish and chip shop is really hard. It's really tough. Loads of them go out of business all the time. And it's a small thing. And it's still really tough. Building a huge company is really, really hard too, and they also <coughs> fail. But when you compare both of them, at the end of the day, once you, if, you, if you succeed at running a fish and chip shop, you've got a fish and chip shop, but if you succeed at running a huge billion dollar company, the, the kind of level of impact you could have is uncapped. Um, and it doesn't, so it doesn't make it that much harder. It's not that much harder to do that. Also, it's really, really important to kind of start off with building really, really important stuff. I don't think it's, it's really tough to, it's really tough to kind of start off, let's do this little thing, and then once we've gone on for a bit, we're going to switch and then a vision will come, or to kind of tag on a vision to the end. It just doesn't work like that in terms of what you need to be the case. And this is kind of linked into the next thing, which is that all the, all the tools and all the resources that you need to build this will see through the second one. They're, they're out there at the kind of first one. All the resources you need to build really important companies are attracted to really ambitious people. All the people in this room that you'd want to hire will want to work for really important companies that make sure they can do it meaningful. All the investors that will give you the cash to work for really important companies will be attracted to really big companies. And customers will want to find something where they can have something that's solved in a big way rather than focusing on a little thing. If you, you, can, if you can solve a tiny problem for me or you can completely change the way we work, then I'm going to pick the second one. Um, and then second to the, third to this, ambitious companies create a ba behavior explosion. And so this is, I think this is really important because it means that the market that you exist, the market being really the biggest, the biggest predictor of success, apart from you, um, kind of, uh, if you assume that you are good, then this, the, the biggest predictor of success will be how big your market is. That can change depending on this behavior explosion. And what do we mean by this? We see that if you're able to build a company that's ambitious, you probably do something which is firstly, you find something's hard, you find friction in the world, all kind of entrepreneurship, all kind of business comes from an element of friction and some person making that friction easier, and a bottleneck, so a thing where you can then control it, it means you can say, have a statement which roughly fits like this. If X were easier, there'd be way more demand to do it, and we'd be able to be the gatekeeper. My, my favorite example of a type of company like this is Google. So when kind of uh, Google first came out, there were search engines, there were kind of Altavitza uh, and Ask Jeeves and stuff like that. Um, and there was a market for it, it was there. But the fact that they were able to use PageRank to mean that, mean that it was really relevant and really accurate meant that suddenly people wanted to access more information way more. And they would use it for kind of tasks, for things that they would, which they wouldn't use it before. And the market for search engines got really, really big. And Google was the gatekeeper for that. Google captured it. Because 
Google then became the verb. Google became how you accessed information because they were the gatekeeper for this behavior that didn't really exist before. In the same way, another great company of this, Airbnb. If staying in strangers' houses were easier, we'd be, there'd be way more demand to do it, and we'd be able to be the gatekeeper. No one wanted to stay in strangers' houses before Airbnb. That was super weird. But they were able to uh, kind of abstract away the, kind of the problem around trust um, around that, and then suddenly there's a huge demand, and hotels are terrified because they've been able to massively create a behavior explosion, which is normal, and no one else does it. It's, it, Airbnb is the gatekeeper. And they're then able to have this really, really huge impact on how this will be the case. And so if you make something easy that's not a bottleneck, if you don't make it where that's really the thing that stops all this behavior, this is, and kind of this is pretty much linked to the hair on fire problem, what you're doing is you're kind of just making someone's life easier in a way that's not really important. And it's not going to create this huge, ambitious, world out there, this alternate world which you create, isn't going to exist because of this. And that's, I think the reason why this is so important is because for everyone in this room, the opportunity cost not to do something massive is, is really, really high. And when you're thinking about Robin Zeehan back at the start, if they have chosen to work on a problem that was not a hair on fire problem, it wasn't a really difficult problem for them, and it wasn't important, then yeah, they'd probably be able to fix it. They're, they're both very smart, and they were able to pull together some smart team around it. Maybe they wouldn't have got as many people, but they'd be able to intellectually solve it, and they'd be able to work on it. But it wouldn't matter as much. They, weren't able, they wouldn't have been able to find something where, at the end of the day, people cared, people were interesting, and it didn't have this greater effect. And that's significant because what they spent with that time has now allowed them to be in a position which is really kind of really important. They're, they're leading these research team in a very large company. If you're, if you're doing something that isn't important and you're doing well at it, and you even might be comfortable, the danger is what else could you be doing? And there's a further point here, which is how the world is changing, how the world is being influenced. And I kind of want to bring it back to kind of what Cassie had talked about at the start, which is the thing at the end around how algorithms are having a real, really huge impact on the world we live in, and some of that isn't always positive. If you think that's a kind of a problem, if you think that's significant, it's up to people like you to fix it and to go out and build the companies that do that. Because the people who are having the most impact in the world right now and changing the way we live, are founders of really large tech companies. If you think of one person and what they would do and how much impact they can have in the world, founding a tech company that grows and scales is the, biggest, is the highest impact thing you can do. One person having influence on the entire planet is really impressive. And that's a, this, is, this, is, this shouldn't be understated in how significant this is in terms of history. Matt, who uh, founded EF, was also a historian. Um, in a previous life. Uh, and he talks about so much that if Napoleon was alive today, he'd found a tech company. He wouldn't bother with armies. He wouldn't bother going around and conquer the world. He would be so jealous of Mark Zuckerberg. Because the reach that Zuckerberg has is bigger than anything, any, it's bigger than most humans have ever had in the planet. And that brings with you interesting problems, interesting stuff that Zuckerberg has to consider. Um, he has to have these weird things where he apologizes for Russia, um, suddenly influencing uh, kind of presidential debates. But he's the one who's kind of controlling that. He's the one who's able to influence in that. It's, it shouldn't be understated how important the, pe the things that the people in this room could do, could be about the world we live in. And if you don't spend enough time thinking about what that thing could be, thinking about the problem that you choose to work on, it could be really dangerous. So that's the message of my talk. Thanks very much. I can take questions on anything. Apparently, Steve Jobs seems to have said that people do not know what they want. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and 
and some entrepreneur will be there who will want to take that risk and say, I'm going to give what people don't even know that they want. Yeah. So, that so this, is, this is kind of like the thing which is like, if you ask people uh, about the car, what, whether they wanted it, they'd say they want a faster horse, right? That's kind of the same thing. If you were talking to people before the car was invented, and went out and talked to them, and they say they want a faster horse. This is kind of a similar comparison. The point is there, you're just asking the wrong question. Don't ask people about a faster horse. But ask people about how they work, how they live, how they travel, what's important to them, and you'll find out what people want. It was, I think, people can't necessarily always imagine the solution, which means that if you spend all your time thinking about solutions, it's not necessarily obvious to you. But becoming an expert in a problem is, is, is it still a way to fix it. And I just, I still think that customer development, which is what this skill, that's not a f term that's uh, familiar to you, that's the skill that this is, is going out and talking to people. It's something that all of you should invest time into because it's a really useful thing to have. Customer development, I still think, is relevant for most things. And there's very, very few cases. There are some cases where you can, you can, you don't have to do customer development. If you've got like a, a panacea that can cure all disease, then like there's probably no point going out, checking if people want to cure disease. If you can do teleportation, there's probably no point in doing that, and actually doubling down and working on that problem is fine. But in the vast, vast majority of cases, in fact, almost all cases that anyone will ever work on here, in this room, you can go out and work on it, and it's still worth going out and chatting to it. I think, I think what the, the interesting thing about our business model is it allows you to very rapidly dismiss ideas. And so we build in a lot of flex. And so people come with us and they get into teams and they start working on ideas. And what we're choosing to back, what we're choosing to kind of select on is the people there. And they remain constant throughout this process. But ideas and teams change. So when you come to EF, there's 100 people in your cohort you'll start working on them. Most people get into a team within the first week. Because those people are strangers, those teams might not always be the best fit. And as soon as you get into a team, we start evaluating, we start working with you to ask the question, is this the very best thing you could be working on? Is this the very best team you could be in? And if it's not, you break up that team, you switch out that idea and you start working on something else. And so there's two ways to think about it. EF is like pretty good at building good companies. What we're really good at is stopping good people working on bad companies. And so acknowledging the fact that lots of companies are bad doesn't really undermine our business model. Because I think actually bringing that to the front and kind of saying it's normal for really smart people to not working, be working on the very, very best the thing they could be working on, it's really important. Because it, then it allows an opportunity for intervention. And that's where we kind of create value, is unlocking that potential, making sure people are working on that. You said you had two questions. Yeah, and the second one is about this burning problems that you have to work on. I don't know, when I hear this, I always think about Alexa and Google Home, and they think they don't, or in the first instance, they didn't offer anything that solves my problems, that made my life hugely better, right? Like, I, I always thought that Alexa is going to fail, because I can, I can Google things myself, I can set the time on myself, but obviously that's not the case. So. I'm not sure if all the problems in the world have to be burning to be worth setting company for. There's, I think there's, there's one problem with the, the burning analogy, which is that um, it kind of connotes death. Um, and it's not the case that all people with burning problems, if those problems were left unsolved, they would die. And I think that's, that's the case with kind of voice first search. As in, life can perfectly go on and exist. I think what you can see though, and also the thing is, Hair on fire problems does not always mean that you are the user. And there are enough people out there where they are interested in, in voice search that they will get Alexis. And people would adopt apps like that. And Alexa came from Eevee, which was uh, a kind of an Android equivalent to Siri, that people were downloading this kind of, it's an, it's an alternative. It's like a, a, a non kind of huge support thing. And they were choosing to download it enough to show to the guys at Amazon, 
oh, actually, this is really interesting, and there are enough people using this that suggests that someone cares about this, and they then acquired it, and then they built it in, and, and that's kind of why the kind of Cambridge has the Amazon lab. Um, and I think what it means is that for you, you might not care, and that's fine. And if you don't care about it, you probably shouldn't be working on it. Um, because I think it's important that you care about what you're working on too. Um, but you need to show that enough people out there do. And that if you can get that by people in large enough quantities using it repeatedly. And the, the general of kind of these hubs, these kind of uh, in, in home devices, the repeated use of those suggests that people are kind of bringing them into their behaviors. And the behavior change is there. And behavior change is really important because that's a good indicator of whether people like it. And so, yeah, I think the problem with Hair on Fire is kind of this, this problem around it, suggesting that it's super serious and it's super, it's super kind of like fatal. Um, what it really means is it's, it's trying to stress the urgency and the severity of that problem that if the solution was there, people would desperately use it and would use it enough that it's worth you working on it. Uh, it's not working, sorry. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to understand is you've talked about one company that's actually been successful as a result of coming through your program. You've also talked about how you stop good people following bad ideas. Have, what, I mean, what's the rate of success of going yeah. through this program? Because to be perfectly honest, Finding a co-founder, as I found, is one of the most difficult things I've had to do. And I'm not even sure if I've found one, but it's still, it's definitely one of the tough things it's to really do. Hard. So I'm curious on your success rate. So this partly defines on like, depends on how you define success. But let's, do, let's, do, let's define success broadly for this as like getting a seed funded company. Um, and the percentages look a little bit like this. It varies from cohort to cohort, which is that about 1,500 people apply for 100 spots. And then of those 100 people, after two months or so, 80% of those people are in a team. And then after a, a kind of three months after getting into a team, they then pitch to get into the next stage. So the first stage is around getting in a team. Um, it's called EF Form. The next stage is called EF Launch. Of those people, about, um, about kind of 70% get through onto EF launch, and all the people on EF launch, about 70% of those uh, raise the seed round, which is a median of um, a million uh, pounds. After, and this is normally about six to nine months after they first met their co-founder, which means that it's a pretty decent success rate compared to being out there in the real world. It's about 40 to 50% of people end up in a funded company. Um, and then of those companies, whether they go on to do well, our portfolio, there's kind of different ways to answer this question. Our portfolio size valuation has doubled every single year we've been around. Um, but still, the majority of our companies are less than two years old. And so judging their long-term success is slightly deceitful for me to go and say they're all alive. But what we can see is this rate of growth is really picking up. And they're getting funded at higher valuations than companies outside of EF in Europe. And they're getting funded faster than companies outside of EF. So that's kind of a good sign there. Then what happens to people who don't build companies is also interesting because I think it's, it's important to separate out, separate out company success from individual success. So if you fail to build a company, the most common outcome is that you join another EF team and you join them as a first employee and then you go off with them in that way. Or you build career capital from failing to found a company. And so you go through that learning process, you become an expert in a particular field, and then commercially you work out it doesn't work, or you work out personally you're not interested in it. And then you use that network of 100 people to find your next role. And so that's kind of how it works. So it does depend on you to find success, which is slightly a semantic way of answering the question. So go back to the first one, which is like building a company. It's about like just a bit less than half. Can I ask, do you take a stake in the company? Yeah, so we take 5% for finding your co-founder. And then we ourselves, um, have about 80 million pounds under management, which we top up that state with as we invest in later stages. And there are different ways uh, we kind of do that. There was a question at the front. Uh, thank you so much. So this was mostly about the ideas, yeah. how you arrive at the idea. But when you look at people at the very first stage, before you even see how they fit in the teams, 
from 500 to 100. How do you do that? You find people who are like people smart. Yes. Ideas, you say? So we don't pay attention to any ideas because they don't exist, right? So how do we evaluate? Um, and the, the kind of the basic point is there's no job description. Really, when we're looking for building companies, we're trying to build the company that you'd be good at, which means we don't really, it's a slight chicken and egg, as in the company that we're trying to build is the one that you should build. And so when really, it's a little bit vague there, which means that we have quite a broad set of things where we're really doubling down on those data points and indexing on those. And we're looking for people that are smart, skilled, committed, and insightful. And smart pretty much means intellect. It broadly correlates with success in most jobs. Um, skilled means what you can bring on day one. We split people into, well, we try and not use the term CEO, CTO. Um, and we use different terms, which I think might be problematic for other reasons and maybe slightly offensive to everyone. But we say talkers and doers. Um, and so talkers do everything that's kind of external. They do fundraising. They do customer development. They do sales. They're really good at that. They double down on that. They still can be technical. Um, and then doers do a lot of the internal stuff. So they do the engineering. They do management. And they do stuff like this. There might be some climate sharing early on in the early days. But eventually, that's the path people are going on. And it's important that people get set on that. So you have this kind of balance of people where some people are really good talkers and some people are really good doers. Then on committed and insightful. Um, committed is simple that if people really want to build good companies. If you're coming trying to find a co-founder, it's really hard. Uh, one of the biggest values is we have 100 people who also want to build the same type of company you do at the same level of ambition. And so we're looking for that. And that they really kind of are ready to kind of give this a, a, good, a real good shot. And committedness is slightly different to confidence. You're not always 100% sure that you're going to build a billion dollar company, but you are committed that you're like ready, ready to really go for it. The insightfulness comes in right at the end, and I think it's maybe the most interesting and key thing that we look for, which is that that statement where we had up about being a, uh, if this thing was a bottleneck and we can unlock it and then we become the gatekeeper for this behavior explosion, that requires you to come up with a kind of contrarian insight of like believing and spotting this bottleneck where most people haven't spotted it. And most people spotting this behavioral thing where you can say, you know what, I believe in a world where people, strangers would stay in other strangers' homes. And if that was the case, then this whole everything would change. You have to be kind of contrarian to be able to come up with that in the first place. And so we're looking for people who are able to get to that level of insight. And there's a few different ways you can do that. Um, I don't want to go on too long about it, but pretty much you're either an expert at user behavior and being able to predict stuff like the Airbnb stuff, or you've worked in an industry for a while and you know stuff about the industry because of that experience compared to 99% of other people starting companies haven't worked in the industry. Or you're technically very impressive and like the Magic Pony guys invent a bit of technology which never existed. And actually that's how they got their name because we used to say don't bother with that technical insight stuff because you're never going to get there. It's very hard to compete. Um, it's like wishing for a Magic Pony. And they said, now nah, we're smart enough. They did it and then they called their, magic, their company Magic Pony Technology. So that's, that's our four things. That's what we look for there.